Hello, I'm Paul Evans and welcome to Airing Pain, a programme brought to you by Pain Concern, the UK charity that provides information and support for those of us who live with pain. This edition is made possible by Pain Concern's supporters and friends. More information on fundraising efforts is available on our Just Giving page, and that's at painconcern.org.uk. I was being told by the medics that I was mad, bad and sad, basically, mainly mad. I didn't have pain, it was all in my head, and it completely devastated my life. I mean, I couldn't work, I couldn't look after my family. Oh, I desperately needed someone else who understood me. If English isn't their main language, it doesn't matter. It's about uh, recognising a change in behaviours and being able to identify that this might be that they're in pain and therefore what are we going to do about it? You put one of the mice in the jail in pain and the other one isn't. If all three mice are female, and if they're cage mates, then the free female mouse will spend more time with the mouse in pain than the mouse that isn't in pain. <laughs> we'll come back to our mice later. They could well be relevant to a pilot project being run by the Community Chronic Pain Services in East Kent, whose lead clinician is consultant nurse chronic pain Val Conway. For patients with learning difficulties, the challenges are that they cannot always express themselves in a way that is obvious that they're in pain. And the other challenges are that some of the carers, perhaps who are looking after them, are inexperienced, may lack training, may not know what to look for as far as uh, pain management is, is concerned. One of the areas that we're looking into is to develop a training package in order that we can help carers look after the clients that they have in their residences. We're currently looking at a tool called Distat, which is a pain tool specifically for people with uh, either learning difficulties or dementia. And hopefully once we get this tool rolled out that we will be able to improve pain management for this vulnerable group. You mentioned communication skills with people with learning disabilities, with dementia, but how do you deal with that? I mean, how does it show itself? It's going back to the basics, basically, and what we're looking at is to see if we can get the carers to assess their client group when they come to the home and have a baseline of what is normal for that person. So, for instance, if it's normal for that person to uh, rock in the chair or for that person to grimace, what happens when they're in pain is that behaviour will change. So it's recognising the change from the normal that is normal for that person. And that's what we find is missing, that carers may not know uh, the change in behaviour is actually something uh, to look for, that they are in pain. How do you train people to notice that? Then? Well, this is what the education package is about, which we're trying to do. So we're going to get the carers to come along and my experienced colleagues um, and myself are going to, to help them identify. We're going to do some role play. We're going to get, some, uh, get them to do some group work to actually try and identify baselines really for these people so that they will notice the changes actually mean something and that way we hope that then the communication skills between the carer and the GP or the healthcare professional will be improved in order to get the right treatment for the client group. Is there a lack of knowledge about pain management in the care system? Yes. There is. Mainly because most of the, the care system now is not within the NHS umbrella it's gone out to private uh, care homes and a lot of the staff are not trained nurses, trained physios. They go into the job because they want to care for people, but often the training is not available in the specialised areas. My memory of my father in a nursing home was that most of his carers were from European countries, non-British countries. Actually, they were very good indeed. But how would you train somebody in that position who spends more time with a patient than anybody else really. How would you train them? And this was what we looked at when we were designing the uh, education package and uh, certainly in Kent where I work a lot of the carers are, are young and English is not their first language 
and therefore the tools that we need to design have to be fairly simple but ones that they can uh, recognize and understand and again if they're using the same tool day in day out repeating it they will get to know the different words and behaviors that they're dealing with so in many ways they're picking up the body language more than the, yes. the spoken language yes i mean again it's looking at the baseline looking at what is normal for a normal inverted commas for this client group and they can recognize that if they can't if english isn't their main language it doesn't matter it's about uh, recognizing a change in behaviors and being able to identify that this might be that they're in pain and therefore what are we going to do about it val conway lead clinician for community chronic pain services in east kent now, one obvious form of body language is, of course, facial expression. If you stamp on my toe, I'll probably grimace. And I know that's not earth-shattering research, but Jeff Mogul, who is the E.P. Taylor Professor of Pain Studies at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, is interested in how facial expression could be used as a measure of pain. But his subjects aren't people, they're mice. Facial expressions of all the emotions are rather stereotyped. People from different cultures and of different ages uh, reliably show the same uh, movements in the muscles of their face when they're angry or happy or fearful or enraged or, as it turns out, in pain. But I'm not interested in that. That's been going on a long time. I was interested in seeing if this works in animals as well as people. Uh, and of course, uh, Darwin wrote an entire book about the subject in 1857, uh, The Expression of Emotion in Man and Animals, where he argued that any emotional state that you can see through a facial expression in humans, you should be able to see in all mammals. And amazingly, no one had ever tried that. No one had ever looked to see if there's a grimace, simply put. Uh, in any other species other than people. Uh, and so we tried it in the mouse, and more recently we've, we've tried it in the rat, and uh, it works. Of course, they do grimace. Interestingly, it works sometimes and not other times. So uh, generally speaking, we find that for pain that lasts anywhere from about 10 minutes to about two days, uh, you'll see a grimace in animals. So you being able to tell that a rat is in pain or happy, whatever, how is that going to yeah. aff affect me? Right. In the pain field, there is increasing frustration with what we call our poor record of translation. And what that means is we have all this basic science knowledge. We, we know all these new molecules that are involved in pain and all these new brain areas. And we really think that we have a good handle on the physiology of pain. The problem is, is that if you look in the clinic and see, well, what's new, uh, you quickly come to the conclusion that really not much at all. Most of the drugs that are used to treat pain at the present time are either uh, drugs that are very much like aspirin, and aspirin is from willow bark, ultimately, and they knew about willow bark 2,000 years ago. The uh, drugs that are used for severe pain, the narcotics, the opioids, well, those are ultimately the same drug as opium, and again, the opium poppy was known 2,000 years ago. And really, there's very little that's new in the treatment of pain. And so people have put these two facts together, that we have all these new molecules, but none of them turn out to have led to anything new in the clinic, uh, has led some to believe that the problem might be that the animal models that we're using to give ourselves confidence that these drugs would work in people uh, just aren't up to snuff. They just aren't uh, doing the trick. And so there's a lot of uh, um, current work on trying to make new animal models or refine the animal models so that they'll be more predictive, so that if a drug works against the model in the mouse or the rat, we can have more confidence that the same drug, if given to people, would actually kill pain. And so a lot of us are working on, okay, what can we do to make new and better animal models? So we recently published that you can use facial expression as a new measure, as a new output measure in animal experiments. So before, generally speaking, we would make some manipulation, we would give some drug, say, and we would poke the animal's foot with uh, thin nylon filaments, uh, and we would find that uh, after the injury or after the inflammation, they would respond to ever thinner filaments. And then if you gave them a drug, they would respond only to thicker filaments again, and we pretended that that was pain. 
but it isn't pain. It's a reflex withdrawal from a stimulus. And this is not what patients complain of. They don't go to their doctors and say, well, I, I find myself withdrawing from thinner filaments than I did before. Uh, or maybe uh, when I used to put my hand on a hot stove, it hurt. But boy, now after my injury, it really, really hurts, right? The, these sorts of things are not the clinical problem. The clinical problem is spontaneous pain. My arm hurts. You don't have to touch the arm for it to hurt. It just hurts. And our problem in rats and mice up to this point is, is that we haven't had very many measures, if any at all, of spontaneous pain. We can poke the, the mouse or the rat with heat or with mechanical pressure, but it, we really have a hard time knowing if an animal is simply in pain. This is where facial expressions come in because facial expressions are commonly used um, in nonverbal humans, right? Obviously, in normal adults, uh, you do a pain study simply by saying, how much does it hurt? And they give you a number and, and you're, you, know, you have your measure. Uh, but in babies, for example, or in demented older adults, you can't ask them because you can't get any answer at all, or at least not an answer you can trust. And so for 10, 20 years, people have been using facial expression to come up with a number of how much pain that baby is in. And we figured, well, that's measuring spontaneous pain, right? You don't have to touch them. You just have to video their face and then figure out a way to score it. Uh, and so we decided, well, if it's good enough for babies, it's good enough for mice. If it works, we can use it as a measure of spontaneous pain that's different from the current measures. And so far, it's been working out really nicely, in fact. In evolutionary terms, is that the purpose of facial expression? That's a really interesting question. It's been argued in humans that the purpose of facial expression, in fact, the person who argued this first, Amanda Williams, is, is at this meeting. I just came from a talk from hers. Um, it's been argued that that's the purpose in people. The grimace is, is a communication strategy um, designed to solicit help, uh, for example, or sympathy or, or something. And it may be the same in mice, but we're not sure. We have one piece of evidence that we find very interesting, where we found that if you put two mice behind sort of jail bars at the end of a corridor. And then you have a third mouse that is able to go wherever it wants, and it can either stay away from both mice or go visit one or go visit the other. And you put one of the mice in the jail in pain and the other one isn't. And the purpose of the experiment is to see where the free mouse spends its time. We find that generally they don't care much. They'll spend a little bit of time with one, a little bit of time with the other, a little bit of time in the middle, with one exception. If all three mice are female and if they're cage mates, if they all come from the same cage so they're familiar with each other, then the free female mouse will spend more time with the mouse in pain than the mouse that isn't in pain, suggesting, and I don't want to push this too far, but suggesting that she was going over to try and help. Well, how does she know that the mouse in pain is in pain in the first place? And we expect it's at least partially because of facial expressions. And so this might be the operation of a communication strategy that's effective in the mouse. Then on the other hand, it's been argued as well that a lot of times things are there and they're ultimately reflexes. And then at, through evolution, primates and eventually humans will use to learn these reflexes for other purposes. And so it's possible that uh, facial expression in animals it has nothing to do with communication, uh, but because it was there and once we got smart enough, we figured out a way to use it for communication. So I'm not sure yet, but that's actually a really good question. I remember from my basic psychology days at university, an experiment in classical conditioning where half our class smiled and the other half of the class just looked disinterested and grumpy. And the teacher would automatically gravitate towards the smiling half. Is that the same sort of thing? Yes, it may very well be the same sort of thing. It, with one exception, though, because one can imagine that in, in that experiment, the professor is uh, spending more of his or her attention on the smiling class because the smiling is more comforting and perhaps uh, looking at smiling people increases his or her mood. But our mouse that's spending time with the mouse in pain is voluntarily approaching something that may very well even be dangerous right? Whatever bad happened to the mouse in the jail, that could happen to the free mouse too. I mean, it doesn't know one way or another. So it's actually doing something potentially dangerous, which is 
all the more impressive that it occurs at all. So you're bringing altruism into the equation now. Yes. And, and, <laughs> and, and humans are the only species supposed to have altruism. Uh, they are, but they're also the only species that are supposed to have empathy. And we actually showed in another series of experiments a few years ago that mice are quite capable of at least the earliest forms of empathy as well. Do you want to hear about this? I do. <laughs> okay. So essentially what we found is that compared to mice uh, that are tested alone in an, a plexiglass observation cylinder by themselves, which of course is how we and everyone else usually does it, if instead of testing one mouse per cylinder, you now test two mice per cylinder, and you compare the situation where one mouse is in pain and the other mouse isn't, to a situation where both mice are put in pain, now remember, in, in the condition where both mice are in pain, not only are they both in pain, but both of them are also now looking at another mouse in pain. And the question is, does that make any difference? And it turns out that it does, that both mice will have more pain than if they were tested alone or tested in the presence of a mouse that wasn't in pain. But only, again, if they're cage mates, if they're strangers, there's no effect of this social observation uh, at all. And after uh, about a year of control experiments that the reviewers made us do later, we uh, uh, convinced ourselves and the reviewers that this represented empathy. Now, uh, your uh, listeners might find that odd, um, but that's because people's understanding of the word empathy uh, and its real definition are not quite the same. When, when we say empathy, most people think of sympathy, but sympathy isn't empathy. In fact, empathy breaks down into four or five different things the bottom layer of which is something called emotional contagion. Uh, and emotional contagion is something that, in fact, everyone is familiar with. Uh, the two great examples of that are uh, one baby in a nursery crying and setting off all the others. Uh, that's emotional contagion. And the other uh, uh, classic example is contagious yawn. If someone yawns, it is more likely than chance that people near them will also yawn. They're not yawning because they're bored or tired. They're yawning specifically because they saw the first person yawn. And that, of course, is empathy. Your state is being manipulated by uh, the state of someone that you're observing. And so we think that our demonstration of increased pain sensitivity while observing a cage made in pain fits exactly into this same category. And uh, human empathy has been shown to modulate pain uh, and also to lead to activation in the same brain regions that are activated when there is real pain. So observing pain in someone else will light up the same areas of your brain as if you were getting the pain yourself. I may be saying the unforgivable here. It seems as if people with chronic pain shouldn't actually mix in crowds of other ah, people in chronic pain. Yeah. Yes, you're right. It, the, the implication of this work is that pain in some sense is contagious. Now, that's just a hypothesis that would uh, obviously need to be shown. And I've been sort of racking my brains trying to think of a way to prove that. Um, and I can only think of one experiment that would work, except I don't think it's practical. Uh, well, I, I, I don't think I'm ever going to get permission to do it. But it strikes me that if you did an experiment where you looked at uh, um, soldiers in basic training who were living in a barracks where they're all living together and no one can avoid, you know, no one can isolate themselves from anyone else. I would be willing to bet that if someone in that barracks got a headache, got a migraine, that you would see in the next 24 hours that others got migraines over and above chance levels. But yes, I, I think that's exactly right. That's the implication, but, it, but it's not proven yet. So where do support groups fit in on this? Well, right. I mean, because it suggests that support groups might be doing a little bit of harm in addition to doing good. Um, it's very important to point out that on balance, I'm perfectly convinced that support groups uh, do more good than harm. And of course, in support groups, people aren't going there just to be in pain. They aren't sitting down being miserable and moaning. They're going to give support to other people and to experience how to get on. Yes, of course, that's right. And one needs to remember that chronic pain patients aren't in pain constantly. Uh, they have attacks of pain uh, that happen at certain uh, frequencies. And so uh, the likelihood that during a support meeting, there would be a whole bunch of people actively moaning because they were having some sort of pain crisis at the moment is actually pretty low. Jeff Mogul of McGill University in Montreal, Canada. I'm not suggesting that patients should sort of sit uh, along over cups of coffee and exchange horror stories. Sometimes that's therapeutic, but you know, I think we can get a lot more out of our relationship with each other than that. 
This is Sue Clayton, who's had neuropathic pain following surgery to relieve her back pain in the early 1980s. Oh, I desperately needed someone else who understood me. I was being told by the medics that I was mad, bad and sad, basically, mainly mad, that I didn't have pain. It was all in my head. I mean, I was in my mid thirties. I had a young family. I had everything to live for. I did not need to have a chronic illness or condition. I didn't know anybody else who had a condition where they didn't get better. Um, people normally have an acute condition and they were treated, it's problem solved. In your mid thirties, you don't tend to know people who have ongoing conditions. And it completely devastated my life. I mean, I couldn't work. I couldn't look after my family. I seriously worried at one point whether I, my children would have to be taken into some sort of care because I was bedridden. And I was experiencing, above all, I was experiencing terrible pain, back pain. I'd had surgery, um, I'd had a second surgery and had been told, yes, the operation's a success, so it's your fault you're not getting better. And that's an incredibly damaging thing to do to somebody. I was left with no support because, of course, what your, in my case, orthopaedic specialist tells your GP affects your GP's attitude. And presumably they were saying that this lady has been operated on, problem solved, you know, what's the problem? But I had unremitting pain, which absolutely destroyed me. And I was being given nothing which even touched the pain. And I was just consumed by it. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I was depressed. I was worried silly. I wasn't much fun to be around. My poor husband had to take the whole brunt of looking after me and looking after family and try to keep a roof over our heads by hanging on to his job, which was quite high pressured. So I felt totally isolated and I really thought, I, am I going mad? I knew I wasn't. I knew the pain was real, but I was being told otherwise. And that absolutely destroys your whole central being. So I was desperate to find out what was going on. This was before the days of the internet. It was incredibly difficult to get access to medical literature so that I to try and research um, what was happening to me. It was really hard. So I happened to see um, a little item in our local newspaper about a work injured nurse who had hurt her back, or damaged her back really badly, actually lifting a corpse at work had had to stop working as a nurse, couldn't get help for her problem. She'd actually ended up going to the Walton Hospital in Liverpool, which then, back in the 80s, was the only pain management programme in the country. And she'd been there and it had helped her tremendously. She'd learned a lot about managing her pain and she'd come back to Whitstable, where she lived, which was quite nearby to where I lived in Canterbury. And she decided to start a self-help group to help other people. And she was holding meetings and I started going. And for the first time I met people who talked the same language as me, who understood what I was going through, other patients. And we shared stories, we shared information, we gave each other support. We had speakers from the medical profession and allied professionals like medical herbalists, acupuncturists, Alexander Technique, therapists of those sorts, physiotherapists. So it became a complete lifeline and from her I began to learn what pain management was about, discover what books I could read, how I could teach myself and it grew very very slowly from there. And that's back in the 80s? This was back in the 80s, so sort of uh, 1985, something like that. So it was an absolute lifeline. If I hadn't found that, I really don't know what I would have done because my life had completely fallen apart and there was no support from the medical profession at that stage whatsoever. I was so angry at what had happened to me. I thought it was disgraceful and that, that people could be left in such a serious condition with their lives completely falling apart the anger impelled me to get involved because I thought this isn't right. Something's got to change. We've got to support these patients. We've got to build links with the medical profession. We've got to make things better. You were instrumental in starting Pain Concern, which was then called Self-Help in Pain. Yes. 
I certainly am very grateful to pain concern in the management of my condition. How do you think that people should use self-help groups like this? I think it's given people somewhere they go to where they feel that they will be understood to start with and where they can get information. For many patients, it has given them contact with other patients who have chronic pain conditions, maybe a different one to themselves, but do have chronic pain. And there is an affinity there which patients respond to amazingly and certainly I found incredibly valuable. Pain Concern has done a fantastic job over the years. Many people have worked very, very hard to build relationships with the medical profession because I think the way forward is for us to work together. And some clinicians have been outstandingly responsive and have wanted to be involved with patient groups, have seen the value and have helped to make that partnership much easier. And that can only be good for other patients. Originally, SHIP and then Pain Concern just issued information about chronic pain, which is usually what people want most of all. And of course, the helplines have offered support and information to people for many years. People who didn't have anywhere else to go, couldn't find anybody else who understood them, nowhere to get advice. Pain clinics perhaps were few and far between. Pain Concern has been able to put people in touch with pain clinics, tell them people what pain clinics can offer. And I think it's just been a, a rallying point really as much as anything, just to give a voice to patients who otherwise wouldn't be heard at all. So Pain Concern is here to help all of us. Now, don't forget that you can put a question to our panel of experts or make a comment about airing pain on our blog, message board, Facebook, Twitter, or via email and, of course, pen and paper. All the contact details you need and a link to download all previous editions of Airing Pain are on our website, and that's at painconcern.org.uk. Now, before we go, let me just remind you, as I always do, that whilst we believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate, sound, based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you and your circumstances, and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. Now, returning to Sue Clayton to end this edition of Airing Pain, she may have a different set of conditions to you, me, or any of the 7.8 million of us in the UK who live with chronic pain, but her experiences in dealing with it will be familiar to all of us. Absolutely. That's why we understand each other. And that's why there is this affinity. And it's impossible to have that feeling with somebody else who, who doesn't have chronic pain. It's just a bonding experience in a strange sort of way. And it's given us strength, above all else, to feel that we can change things. We can come together. We can make a difference. We can work so that services will be improved, that policymakers will, we hope, eventually understand the scale of the problem, the difficulty of addressing the problem. And I think what needs to happen now is that through political pressure where the patient support groups are working with clinicians to present a united voice to policymakers that perhaps we can develop much better integrated, comprehensive services staffed by clinicians who've got adequate training and clear pathways so patients understand when they're referred, what it will mean, who they will see, why they will see them what support is ongoing. I think patients need both good official medical services and they also need the opportunity to meet other patients if possible or at least communicate with other patients and of course that's now changed enormously with the internet, patient forums, um, email. Um, it's completely revolutionised the way patients can cooperate and, and talk to each other which is a huge bonus and I think actually this has potential to take a great load off the health services in many ways because patients can raise the profile and make a difference to the way the services are provided so they are suitable for the people who are going to be using them.